Welcome back, everybody. It is the Working Brother back at you with another talk. We've got John Bosnich with us. John, how are you doing? Just fine, thanks. Good to be with you. Excellent. Good to have you back. I'm a little bit, uh, I want to say headache, but it might be a hangover. I don't know what it is exactly, but I'm a little under the weather, as they would say. So we'll see how this comedy show goes today. Everybody who's new here, hi, welcome. This is a comedy show. Nothing here is uh, real or has anything to do with reality. Um, John has been here many times. Uh, we'll leave uh, a bunch of links in the notes for uh, other talks that we did with John. John, a lot has happened since you were back uh, with us here. But um, I came across this uh, quote from Julian Assange that I wanted to uh, touch upon with you. Because I have a feeling that uh, you might have something to say about it. Um, he was asked uh, what has been his biggest disappointment. And he says that learning that even intelligent people can be cowards and that courage is much rarer attribute than intelligence, says Julian Assange. How do you feel about that? I agree. That's, uh, I think that's pretty obvious. We've got uh, literally millions of people with uh, PhDs in North America. Millions upon millions of people who are a doctor of philosophy in their chosen field of lifetime study. And uh, among these millions of people who are at the pinnacle of our educational system, we have uh, one in a million, like Jordan Peterson, or like uh, even uh, Robert F. I don't know Kennedy if you missed it. Jr. I don't know if you missed it, but Jordan Peterson uh, started shilling for uh, Zion. So, yes, yeah. I, I, you know, um, on the whole, I've agreed with what Jordan Peterson has said. We went to the same university at the same time. We didn't know each other, but we were both at McGill University in Montreal. Mm -hmm. in the oh, same so he's McGill. That explains yeah. a lot. Yeah, he's a <laughs> McGill, McGill alumnus. And uh, <laughs> at that time, that was the best school in Canada. So we, we were at the same campus at the same time. And uh, that was an era in which there was a, 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 the beginnings of a right wing or conservative uh, backlash against uh, leftism and wokeism, even if it was pre-woke. These are the these are the 1980s when uh, I went to the Canadian Federation of Students annual gathering. They have a kind of a national assembly or national convention of the student leaders across the country and at that time i was known as one of the more radical and more direct democracy oriented student leaders and they didn't know if i was conservative or leftist or what and we went to a meeting of the canadian federation of students i went with a delegation from our school we all had identification you know it looked we came to a completely left-wing organization and we walked in and uh and they said, uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, you uh, you people there from uh, from New Brunswick, um, you're 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 not very welcome at the gathering. I said, wait a minute, we pay our dues. We're a student union. We're elected. We got the highest turnout of any un union election in the entire country this year. We put the we put the administration on on notice that they have to respond to students' demands, and the students' demands can take any form that the students want to initiate by themselves. And this was so radical at that time to have referenda that the students could initiate, that they could take positions that may not be along the lines of the left wing on, on different issues. But uh, it, it was a real, it was a real eye opener because our, uni our university student union was closed down. The police were brought in with weapons to arrest the student union government, my student union government. We were we were completely peaceful. I mean, I didn't occupy even anything. A completely peaceful elected student union government of relatively conservative uh, right wing people was locked out because we discovered we went through the documents. We went through what had happened to the students' rights and the students' control over the student union building, over the cafeteria, of all the businesses, and we learned that everything that had been contributed by us and bought for bought by us, by our fees over 50 years, had been somehow privatized into the hands of the friends of the university. And they had monopolies. And they hadn't paid any increase in rent since the 1960s. 
And we discovered all of this. We found these documents. We thought, oh my goodness, they're paying $6.25 per square foot rent. And the real rent, we called in the national number one appraisers just to prove that we're doing it according to the system. We brought the best appraisers in Canada. We brought them down to a little town in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And, uh, and the real minimum rent for those spaces was $18 a square foot. Think about that. Student radicals <laughs> do a survey of the real appraised value of the real estate that they bought, paid for, and find out that the university has been renting it out at one third of its real rate to their friends as a kind of kickback for donations that are tax deductible. And we're talking millions and millions of dollars. You no, said we, uh, privatization. We discovered this. We, discover said- this, we published this. You said privatization, they, and that uh, yeah, they privatized. Po- they privatized the student. The student union has, let's say, eight commercial spaces, which were originally set up to be run by student cooperatives or student groups that would sell. I don't know, run a convenience store to to raise money for their activities, whatever they may be, physics club or who knows what. At the beginning, these places were set up by students who were in their final year of university or who had just graduated and wanted to form a co-op kind of a store. Well, okay, some of these guys just turned sides and became hardcore capitalists and decided that they were going to privatize for themselves. Not It's no longer like the science club. Well, yeah, obviously. If you're going to privatize it, it's going to be for yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're there. Like he's going to have a there, kickback. And they're there for 30 years paying the 1968 rental rates because they control the organization of the, of the student union building administrative committee, which is all a bunch of bootlickers and ass lickers who are picked by the administration via a compliant student union, which has a faculty advisor. John, <laughs> I got to pull okay. you back into the present. You mentioned I, I just uh, you privatization. This is, Osno- this is the Osnovny problem in western problem. society student well, governments are puppet organizations well that that might be and that's your that's your training that's your training for the real world yeah you go to high school it's a puppet organization you go to university it's a puppet organization you go out into the real world and you think well that's what politics is it's a bunch of puppets and and you are therefore convinced by your own bad experience to believe that participatory democracy doesn't exist that it's not worth fighting for because you've never experienced it even at the student level so forget it illusions are okay. gone just do it work okay john i'm gonna have to okay. stop you you're gonna have to stop. stop talking now because you're talking about things in the past yes. um and you already triggered me twice first you said privatization and then you said elections um yes. we've had elections here in serbia recently we'll get into that a little bit later but uh, did you vote no, I did not. I went to my, <laughs> Excellent. I, I, went, I, I don't. I don't care. I don't care. We'll get into it later. Now I you said private. No, no, no. We'll get into it later, John. Yeah. Um, yeah. Privatization uh, brings us neatly onto the criminal privatization that is happening uh, in the southern Serbian province of Kosovo and Metohija, where um, you know uh, this happened a couple of days ago. Uh, the so-called Kosovo Agency for the Protection of Competition has fined the temp, uh, company MTSDO, which is the Serbian uh, mobile services provider, um, state-owned branch of the Telecom Serbia in Kosovo and Metohija for blah blah because of blah blah. Okay, that's the first thing that they did. Then uh, they did this. Um, or no, this is yesterday's news. Yeah, this is yesterday's news, where the defense minister, uh, the so-called minister of defense, uh, whatever his name is, stated that there, if there are threats from Serbia, then soldiers, quote-unquote, of the so-called Kosovo security forces will be sent to the north of Kosovo, where it's a Serbian majority enclave. Then, just a couple of hours ago, um, this popped up on my feed. Um, so the Kosovo quote unquote police are taking down public security cameras in the north of Kosovo. And uh, then also one should be aware that this uh, UCK, which is the uh, 
what was it? Uh, Kosovo Liberation Army in English, a uh, terrorist organization from the 90s, uh, is getting uh, branded all over uh, northern Serb dominated uh, population, po- Serb population dominated uh, northern areas within Kosovo. What do you have to say about all these uh, developments and escalations that have been uh, going on in the last week or so? Uh, these are typical provocations. I think that this is, uh, once again, uh, what we are facing in Kosovo is similar to what Russia was facing in Ukraine uh, and what um, Iran is facing in the Shia regions of Iraq and, and so on. It's an encroachment on your ethnic kin or on your territory by the empire and um. the empire has it's like an octopus and it wherever it can push its tentacles further into the territories of others wherever the resistance is least they will they will aggressively pursue that project and that's what's happening and before uh, you go on i just want to draw attention to the act to like this picture is the uck which is the actual thing but it's national meme coordination body which fixed it and like yes. added a little bit of text you know this is the french uh, german plan um yes. um but yeah uh, go on go on sorry to I, sorry to interrupt you know, uh, it, 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 i know this is a comedy show <laughs> and and and, and it's, imp- it's important to try to detach oneself from uh, one's understanding of uh, incompetence, general incompetence in government, and and expand that view because the level of incompetence and and literal tomfoolery that's been taking place on the part of NATO and its colonies has gone beyond the, the, the regular background level now. We're seeing uh, a genocidal crimes against humanity, against the civilian population in Gaza as we speak. With the oh, United yeah. oh yeah, we'll get to Gaza for sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of material that. there. We're seeing the ongoing neo-Nazified, ultra-nationalist, at least, Ukrainian army uh, going down to defeat in its suicidal kamikaze grand offensive in which the president literally burned up his own uh, menfolk to try and impress America that he should get more money. That was a disaster of the first level. Um, we're seeing China strongly respond to American provocations and build up around the Spratly Islands and around the Taiwan Straits. So empire is on the defensive everywhere. Empire is overextended and empire is now having the, 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 the credits called in by Israel which is disrupting the empire's ability to fight where it had an aggressive war trying to take territory, to take Ukraine. And now it's going on a defensive to try and hold on to Israel by crushing the Palestinians into submission. This is, this is, these are not divisible topics. These yeah, even are we discussed sim- it with, uh... simultaneously linked uh, tied events. We discussed it recently with Soviet Russian Bear, and uh, we mentioned that uh, even Liz Truss, you know, the one who lost to uh, Cabbage, um, she even said that it's the same war, Ukraine and Gaza. Oh, yeah. yeah. And on it, that it, note... It, 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 the same war on all of the fronts. Not yeah, even, yeah. Not just here, but also in Asia. It's one war. It's a world war in its preliminary stages and we'll see if we can evade the world war or not uh, we're in like let's say the 1935 36 37 38 period in which you have issues with sudetenland and you have issues with the ruhr and the rhine valley and you see encroachment bit by bit by nazi uh forces and their and their uh, you know the parallel of today's neo-Nazi NATO mm-hmm. deployments. And they're in the same areas and they're in the same manner. 
So we're seeing a repeat of the same old project. Which did you luckily, see the news? Did you see the news about this neighborhood in Gaza being leveled all at once today? Yeah, yeah. completely um, uh, destroyed, massacred anybody who's in there. It uh, it uh, is the sign. It, this kind of behavior is the sign of desperation. This is the, the sign of an empire that's uh, that's uh, a, a war chariot with a wheel lost. It's lost a wheel. And it's and it's swinging on one wheel left and right, slaughtering people, massacring bystanders. It's a uh, and and the man who's driving it is senile and blind. So this <laughs> is the picture of America today. Um, I was trying to get some pictures and memes, but this is about as funny as I could come up with. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That pretty much summarizes it. On the other hand, I've got an actual meme that I actually made when your Christmas tree is uh, Eastern European. <laughs> good. Nice. Good. <laughs> um, all right, John. Uh, we've got other topics to discuss here. Right. Um, how do you feel about Assad and the Assad curse? <laughs> In, uh, okay. First, you have to tell me what the Assad curse is, if I'm going to... Um, you know when when people say that Assad must go, oh, yes, usually then. usually something befalls them. Yes. Um, right. Here we have an actual NAFO su su suicide. <laughs> we can't really say this stuff, but yeah, looks like another NAFO troll has fallen to the Assad curse. <laughs> um, who, we, what who do you fell think? This time? I'm sorry, I didn't see which one we're talking about falling. They're falling um, left they're, and right. They're, they're, there's just like, you know, NAFO trolls, people who yes, are on okay. Twitter who just like cheer on war, basically, for the West. And right. uh, one of them has gone offline, so to say. That's um, how do you feel about the fact that Venezuela, Syria could be a second front for, uh, or third even, or fourth for the China? U.S. global hegemony. Well, uh, I'm fully, ex I'm fully expecting some some further American uh, funded um, activity inside Venezuela. Uh, no matter what, no, no matter what victory the Venezuelans score against uh, American intrusions in their territory, uh, that is not going to stop the Americans. Venezuela is the single richest petroleum reserve in the world. It's the closest to America. It is uh, very difficult to supply from Russia, from uh, China, and only hope is Cuba. And Cuba itself is under pressure from America. So it's a kind of a dangling, uh, low-hanging fruit is what Venezuela is in the eyes of the American war machine, oil-driven war machine. So we can certainly expect to see something coming in the Venezuela front. Um, I also think that we're going to see more disturbances in Nigeria because Nigeria has a you know, heavy uh, duty supply of oil, which is just one short Atlantic run away from America. So these two countries are the low hanging fruit and they are going to be targeted for takeover by, Amer by America. Um, Venezuela is going to have to prepare, and uh, I, I trust that they're doing the best they can to install missile defense, which is what they'll absolutely have to have. And uh, we'll just see how, uh, how um, what, what level of risk-taking behavior the oligarchs of America are ready to engage in at this stage of the game. Because uh, oh, there's a good this topic. Yep. Yeah, speaking of this stage of the game, uh, how do you uh, feel about the recent shift in narrative, uh, you know, in the Western media where all of a sudden they're contemplating the idea that, you know, Putin yeah, well, and the this Kremlin reminds me, yeah, it reminds me of uh, Lincoln's purported saying that you can, you can fool all of the people some of the time. And you can fool some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people. All of the people, all, all of the time. time. And so what has happened is the the persistent 
leaking because it's 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 a sealed encapsulated bubble of no pro russian no neutral reporting uh so first there's absolutely no pro russian news allowed into the west and there's no neutral reporting because neutral reporting is even more dangerous to the western establishment because if a person is seen as being neutral and they say uh Good you know, things Russia, about Russia, yeah. <laughs> Russia is right, and we're wrong. This is why the Oliver Stone um, interviews, documentaries, be, yeah. This is where the turning point in the narrative, because you've got a well-known American, pro-American uh, critic of Israel, who himself is Jewish, who's criticizing the entire power structure of America and previously produced films about the Vietnam War really revealing things that Americans had not faced. And now you've got this guy who's an, an American icon going and interviewing Putin and letting Putin speak without cutting him off, without censoring him. And this opened a new front. Um, this new front, the information war, then became the critical front in all of the in all of the conflicts because there's money for weapons uh, armies are ready to fight but there has to be some sort of public consent to the process if if you want to be able to maintain it and and, and this is where uh, the uh, information war has really come to the fore it doesn't matter anymore where the front is it just matters what the news about that purported conflict is and how viable it is as a selling point to an audience that can determine whether or not they're going to let their government continue that war. This, this is now truth versus lies in a in a maze of hundreds of pod, podcasts of mainstream media of lying mainstream media of this is now an information war the first information war it's not a real resource war it's not a trade routes war it's not a colonial conquest war it's an information war and the two views are based on two different views about the way humanity should operate all for one one for all or all for me none for you <laughs> those are the, those are the, that's that's the two versions yeah yeah nobody Sums can, pretty you know but can fully deliver because we're all flawed but there is a different approach focus. yeah there's yeah. a different approach and, and a different um attitude towards uh, partners as they call right. themselves in the international diplomacy sphere uh, right, i just right. want to take a little break and uh, thank all the supporters everybody who's bought me a coffee somebody also bought me five coffees recently so thank you to anonymous person who buys me coffees from time to time for fuels the show theoretically um john i should get a coffee but uh um you can get a coffee do you want to go for a coffee give me one but, second uh, i'll be right back for real huh okay yeah. i was kind of joking but well, okay no, well, I'm uh, the water on when it when it's done i'm just gonna do in, instant coffee so i'm just gonna turn it on off here when it's done I'll, I'll, I'll pause the recording then. all right uh i think we're recording now again and uh john changed his mind and it did not go for a coffee but no, um I, I just turned the water on to uh i turned the water on to uh just make an instant coffee so I don't have to be there. But anyway, I, I just wanted to say to you, I mean, this is not a product placement here. I, I got these tiny little lights. And <laughs> these are these are amazing. Lume Cube. Um, they just to let you know. I'm enjoying the dark thing. I don't. I don't need to. I know you're show. The, dark, I, you're I, the force I, of I, darkness. I, I'm the force of light. No, I'm. I'm, the, I'm the light like coming from the know, darkness. Got, I'm the light bright, coming from the darkness. Lights. I've got brighter you know. lights than normal now. <laughs> That's I'm all. I'm the light coming from the darkness. Plus, it would get too hot here. It would get so hot that there was no whatever and whatever and whatever. That's how hot okay, it is. No um, just a meme <laughs> that I ran across the other day. Um, 
So, John, you wanted to touch upon local elections. I've got a meme about that as well. Um, well since thanks to the donkeys, um, now I'm going to go uh, have a talk with uh, Vucic. Um, so the conspiracy theorist, as he's uh, referred to or labeled, uh, Dr. Nestorovic, who we've become familiar with recently, he's also a flat earther, apparently. Um, but the point is, uh, he said that uh, if there's any threat of violence by the opposition or whoever, that he's going to join uh, into a coalition with the ruling party. How do you feel about this uh, change of tune? <laughs> I think uh, it's a uh, it's a public relations uh, damage control move. I think that's what we're seeing here. I I think that if we if we see uh, uh, an increase in the sort of civil unrest or disruption of the traffic in the downtown by opponents of the ruling uh, SNS, which has won an absolute majority according to their counters, um, then then one of the main focuses of government counter propaganda will be the me group that Dr. Nestorovich leads because the me group is a new factor in, in Serbian politics. It received a, a, a low level of support, but enough to get into the parliament. And now there are some voices that have been openly critical of this government, of this regime, not just this one, but of the Democrats, Kastranke, the Democrat, so-called Democratic Party before the so-called Progress Party. So these people have been on the fringe. The, many of them are my friends. So uh, that, that tells me where we are. We're on the fringe of permitted speech in Serbia on the mainstream mainstream media and on the mainstream um, portals, uh, web portals. So many of these are, are my long-term friends, Dr. Nestorovic, um, Alexander Pavic, I've known almost from when I arrived here in the, in the uh, you know, 1990s. So these are people I trust and, and know to be good, patriotic, honest, open Serbs. So good for them however the politics the, yeah, however, <laughs> however um, the distinguishing factor here is that these people pose a an existential threat to the system unlike any other parties which have lost votes the me group has, if I understand the results correctly, they basically supplanted both Dveri and Zavetnitsi. Um, just to clarify, the me group is not me like me, it's me in Serbian, which means us or we. Yeah, it's a political group called uh, us, uh, the, the voice of the people, so which translates into me glas naroda. Uh, here in in Serbian. So now that you say it like that, it sounds a lot like glasnost, which we all know was a color revolution thing. So anyway, continue, please. <laughs> uh, so it uh, so the me group uh, has uh, has capitalized on a growing understanding of the past of the country because uh, their symbol is uh, something that was banned in, in public use for many years, which is the Serbian traditional shaikacha, uh, which basically disappeared except on a few farmer's heads for uh, two generations under Tito's rule because that was the hat used by the Royal Army. And so it was basically banned and everybody had the folding Titovka, which is much like an American lieutenant's cap which just folds in uh, into a flat cap okay so that's the symbol of the party this party logo is this serbian traditional shaikacha cap i have one around here but i don't think i can pull it right out i also um, do but it's but it's also like uh somewhere in the other room like i i, I don't have it handy i can maybe okay. look up a i can maybe look up a picture while, while you well, give me, talk give me Give me one second. I might have one. My, my uh, John, always my, happy my, to walk my, off camera. Yours, so John, know. always happy to walk off camera in the middle of an interview. Um, yeah. What can I say? I'm back. 
<laughs> John, um, I came across this ikigai, which uh, you, as a resident of Japan, long time, would have something to speak to. How do you feel about the ikigai principle? You know, I'm not a big uh, practitioner of any, uh, let's say... Eastern? No, I spent a long period of time there, but I found that the that, that many of these uh, traditional sort of um, people's analysis of things in Japan have been shaped and reshaped by the system. Japan had a absolute dictatorship, military dictatorship under the shogun for hundreds of years in which basic practices were ordered on pain of death so i'm i'm not an an analyst of the resulting traditions except to know that they are a weakness that can be exploited against japan okay so i don't usually go into an analysis of their of their uh, traditional belief systems because i think that their traditional belief systems have been used against them by the American occupiers. It's so you think they've been like hot. supplanted basically and like, you know, subver been, subverted through these... Uh... They've been incorporated into a kind of p passive acceptance uh, culture in which the Japanese people who were occupied by America and continue to be an occupied state have, uh, have like the Germans, have accepted their virtually perpetual occupation by America and the accepting group is the minority but it rules both in Germany and in Japan so it's a compliant minority which is financed guided advised and led basically by American advisors who run the state through front front characters who pretend to be Japanese or German politicians that's it um, John, we've sad, got. I mean, uh, sad, but, sad but true. You know, I I served the end of my service as a advisor to the Japanese government came during the rule of uh, Koizumi, whose favorite musician. Okay, this is a Japanese prime minister whose favorite musician in the world was Elvis Presley, and he celebrated the arrival of his American occupier, American President Bush. He celebrated his, his arrival by singing, uh, by singing Elvis Presley songs with the American president. You can't, you can't be more self-effacing and uh, and uh, and um, obsequious than that. Can't obsequious. Do it. Yes. Aren't you being grandiloquent today on this comedy yeah, show? This, this, this is the word, but uh, 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 um, um, ass licking politeness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, Bad. yeah, as I was. I, the Japanese nation is a, is a traditional uh, warrior uh, led nation that has been neutered as if they were eunuchs in the imperial uh, palace in China. That's the level of self-neutering that the Japanese have done. And uh, they, 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 they decapitated their society. They emasculated the men, turned them into work robots who didn't have any contact with their own children, creating a generation after generation of much weaker young Japanese men than before who are even more compliant and uh, gutted, gutted the uh, independent nature of the japanese people okay that's my analysis okay we'll call this segment john rips uh, japan a new one um, but no I have, seriously I have, uh, I have many japanese friends mm -hmm. who are the exception yeah. That. yeah 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 that's how that's how we built our friendship i met mm -hmm. japanese people who had independence guts uh, bravery, honesty, and clarity to realize that, hey, this is, I'm not part of this, and I'm not going to be part of this, and I'm openly going to speak against this. These are my closest, best Japanese friends.
I've got a recording of Julian Assange talking about Serbia in 2014 that I'm going to play and get your reaction to. And then we've got one more meme and we're done. But before we get to that, I wanted to ask you, because I know that you're going to be uh, uh, shifting location, so to speak, uh, yes. that your uh, schedule is changing and your uh, focus might uh might be, uh, how should I say, broadening. Uh, do you want to clue in people to what your uh, plans are in the near future and where you'll be and uh, do you draw attention to anything that you might want to? Sure, sure. Oh, so first, uh, I, my incredibly l long overdue delayed trip to Canada is on the doorstep now, finally. Um, as you probably, if you've been following this, uh, on the odd chance that you are or were. Um, I was unable to go to Canada for two years and a bit because of the COVID uh, vaccine requirement, which I refused to take. So I couldn't enter Canada at all because I was unvaccinated. And just the process for entering the country was, if you're unvaccinated and you come back to Canada, you can come, but you have to go into this camp where you go into a quarantine where you pay $200 a day or something per day for who, mo who knows how many weeks, which you have to pay to your own state. So we're talking thousands of dollars that you have to pay. I just want to be state. clear. I just oh. want to be clear, John. John, you're joking. Yeah, this is all a no, joke. Not. This, no, no, this is all a joke on this comedy all show. Right. Okay. Like, it so, has nothing to do with reality. <laughs> yeah, exactly. On there me. you go. There you go. Joke Legally on speaking, me. all of this is a joke. Go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> joke on me and my fellow Canadians. We're, we, we didn't laugh much. We didn't get the joke, but the joke was on us, right? So for two years, no, no, no trips home, and then uh, um, after that, I had to get a uh, my passport. In the meantime, expired. I had to get a new passport, but the new law in Canada was you can't get a passport unless you come to Canada to get it, uh, to get the birth certificate original. And I can't enter the country. I was in a catch twenty two, classic catch twenty two, caught in the middle of nowhere, uh, and uh, I finally managed to. Uh, get a get a access to uh, a, an archive that I'm not supposed to get access to to get a birth certificate to get a passport to get back. Now I'm ready to travel, and uh, and it looks like there's a possibility that they're going to put new restrictions for a new virus again in Canada. But anyway, I'm shortly going to make my trip via New York City. While in New York, I'll be meeting with people. Uh, related to the hemp business and to the, to the medicinal cannabis business who are overwhelmingly in favor of investing in Serbia when Serbia finally catches up with the rest of the world in legalizing medicinal hemp-based products. That means CBD and THC. Um, THC is the one that people get high on. Uh, CBD is the one that is used to relax people. Even though we're not allowed still in Serbia to extract to, uh, to extract even CBD, the the non drug component, you can buy CBD here in Belgrade, and there are photos now of stores in Belgrade selling CBD, which we Serbs, mm -hmm. who used to be the number one producer of cannabis in the world per capita, are not allowed to produce our own CBD, but we can buy it imported from Croatia. Uh, Ukraine, uh, wherever, but not from us, not from our farmers who are missing out on the biggest agricultural bonanza in the history of farming. Why, why do I get this is sneaky suspicion that this has something to do with EU ascension laws and like, you know, getting ready for like, you know, the European market? <laughs> the, 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 the main point is the EU doesn't want us to become rich before we join the EU, because then if we're already rich, we won't need to join the EU as a pauper with our hands out looking for subsidies because we'll be richer per capita than they are. And they'll be coming to us for subsidies. And everybody goes, oh, John, don't be unrealistic. When would you ever see a German coming for a subsidy from Serbia? Okay, remember that Srebrenica was a mine for Tsar Dushan in the Serbian Empire and the Gastarbeiters came from Germany to try to earn enough to eat when they worked for the Serbs at our silver mine. And of course, Srebrenica, if you if you have managed to dodge the 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 many, many years of narratives from the West about Srebrenica, Srebrenica was the center of the Serbian Empire's 
silver production for the currency that we use for the empire. You can't have an empire without a currency. So srebre is the Serbian word for silver. And srebrenica is the Serbian word for silver town. The Serbian town of silver town. That's what um, srebrenica is. It Serbian is. imperial mint. Not... Uh, you were, you were talking, you, you got a little sidetracked when you started yeah. with a, a hemp business in uh, New York. I think you mentioned you're going through yes, New York. So I'm going to New York because what I want to do is I want to meet there with people who are in, in the financing of the hemp business because we want to make a world-class hemp business in this region. Uh, unfortunately, our, uh, our Serbian farmers will be forced to grow hemp that has a, a, a minutely a very low level of CBD, 2%, and try and compete against people who are legally growing 20% CBD across the border in Croatia or in Bosnia. Anyway, we'll just try and compete when we're 10 times, 10 times punished by our own government to not allow us to grow high CBD cannabis plants. Anyway, we'll try to compete and try to extract and try to earn money and move these operations to surrounding countries, to Romania, to Montenegro, to Macedonia. And how long, how long do you think uh, you'll be away for your uh, North oh, American trip? trip? I'm going to go to New York for a week first for these meetings mm -hmm. and to also meet with Barry Latucci. Barry Latucci is the head of the Yasenovitz Research Institute based in New York, who has been the leading voice worldwide in bringing the world to know about Yasenovitz and our suffering during the Holocaust. We are the seventh death camp, the one that nobody knows about. There were six that we're all taught about when we talk about the Holocaust, but the death camp where, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of Serbs were killed along with tens of thousands of Jews and gypsies, this this camp is unknown. Uh, Barry Latucci is the man who has brought that to the world's attention. His parentage is half Serbian and half Jewish from Ukraine. So he has a very, very wide view of events and has been very active in denouncing the uh, warmonger regime in Kiev, which is, uh, which is backed by neo-Nazis. Neo Neo-nasties, uh, just to keep this as a comedy show. Fans uh, of nuts, new age fans of nuts. Um, right. Uh, let's have a peek at this uh, Assange statement, which okay. is from 2014. My name is Julian Assange, and I'm recording this for you from inside the Ecuadorian embassy of London. But Serbia is a country in between. Like many countries in between, the Ukraine among them, Serbia is a pivotal pioneering place. It is a place where the future happens first for all its horrors and all its beauties. Like all pioneers, Serbia is a country that is constantly misrepresented. Misrepresented by decision makers and opinion formers, by the outside world, and yes, sadly, sometimes by Serbians themselves. Sometimes it is misrepresented because it is misunderstood. As our material shows, Serbia is distorted, condemned and patronized by the outside world in a conscious and even cynical manner. Sometimes the world does not feel entitled merely to distort Serbia. Sometimes it has felt entitled to attack it. As everybody knows, just 15 years ago, Serbian journalists were bombed from the air by NATO and killed. This is the only time that NATO has admitted to intentionally killing journalists. Not surprisingly, many Serbs are not sure who to trust. They cannot trust the murderers and criminals from the Milosevic era. They cannot trust the East, and they cannot trust the West. How do you feel about what we just saw? Stravo. So, let me My put name is... <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So That's 2014. Keep that in mind. Right. So, first of all, I'm going to go backwards through his piece, because it ends with the murderers and the criminals of the Milosevic era, which is evidence of the fact that even Julian Assange, in part, took the bait from the Western media. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fell for the narrative. Yeah, yeah, I get what you said. Fell for the narrative that Milosevic was a criminal and a war criminal and a, a smuggler and whatever. Um, this, uh, this, um, 
Western generated lying mainstream media narrative about Milosh, which is largely false. We were a, con a country which was under the heaviest sanctions in modern history. You couldn't buy uh, petroleum, you couldn't buy gasoline, you couldn't drive your car. People were selling gasoline on the side of the street from Coca-Cola bottles, two liter Coca-Cola bottles. And that made everybody in the country who had a life and did anything had to become a smuggler or a purchaser of smuggled goods because there was no legal way to get access to fuel and fuel was essential for the entire economy. So first of all, we were turned into a nation of smugglers without actually doing anything illegal, which was just to buy fuel to drive our cars. Um, then we were demonized and turned into a nation of, of, uh, of genocidal murderers, even though we have a massive population of Muslims inside Serbia, none of whom were harmed or killed or expelled or in any way aggrieved. We also have a massive population of ethnic Hungarians. We have populations of nations that nobody else even recognizes as nations. We have a Vlach population. We have gypsy population. These are all uh, nations inside the country and they use their own languages. It's not, it's not an assimilatory society. So we have, in Vojvodina, we have more than 20 languages that people are allowed to be educated in, in public schools. This doesn't exist in the West. And to hide this reality of multilingual, multi-ethnicity with respect to other nations, which is the real Serbia, they created a complete Frankenstein of a Serbia in which Serbs are all a, a monolithic, racist culture that hates everybody around them. Hmm. Sounds a lot like the Russians, man. Sounds a lot like the Russians. <laughs> it, it sounds a lot like the picture they paint, painted of the Russians who have multi-ethnic coexistence with more ethnic minorities that have not been assimilated than any country in the world. These are, so really it's Orwellian, it's black-white Whatever is white and good, so-called, if you take white as the good things, uh, white becomes black, black becomes white. And only just because they say it, because they have a, a force-fed psychiatric audience, psychiatric victim of, of psychiatric, psychological brainwashing that will eat any message fed to them by the masters who've trained them. They don't have the ability to exit themselves from the controlled thought narrative. And I'm sorry to say that this affects a very high percentage of Americans. I would say it's more than 90%. This is not good. And democracy cannot exist in that environment. That environment is poisonous to democracy. And it creates this plutocracy where money controls everything. And this is what connects the Israel-American axis of power, money. And the preponderant influence of the Israel lobby on American politics is what allows the crimes against humanity today in the Gaza Strip. It's John? An, an, an indivisible matrix that spans the world. And as the world turns, you just look at a different part of it. John, I want to thank you for coming on. I also want to thank you for uh, clearing up my headache. Whatever it is that you were uh, doing just now definitely helped me clear up my, uh, you know, clogged up mind. Um, a little bit of spinning. A little bit of spinning the globe and watching it turn and then realizing that there is no other side of the globe. We're all on one side, the surface of the globe, and the people who control the surface or the plate, of the globe, if it's we flat. are trying to do it everywhere else. <laughs> you know, if it's flat, we're all on the same plate. Yeah. yeah I'm, not, um, I'm not a flat earther. Being a world champion geodesist. Yes, yes, I, we've I, discussed it. We've flat. discussed it. Right. we've discussed it um i've got a last meme for today 
Uh, people who, who may have followed intently know that I'm a pilot. Well, a drone pilot. <laughs> um, in any case, everybody who stuck around to the end, thank you for sticking around. John, thank you for coming on. It took a while to... Uh, yeah, yeah, no worries. It was just a talk, comedy show and all. Right. Um, we'll see you soon. Maybe you will get to hear from you in Canada. Oh, yeah, in New York. On. Even from New York. Be all right. That'll be York. possible as well. We'll get your take on right. how uh, the Big Apple is. All right, John. Catch you soon. Peace out. Peace out.